All right. So welcome everybody to another episode of the Soccer Performance Podcast. Today we have Elizabeth Eddy. Uh, I'm going to let Elizabeth introduce yourself, but first of all, thank you so much for joining us this morning. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Um, I've been playing pro soccer for the last nine years in the NWSL. I grew up in California, played soccer at USC on scholarship, and it has been a, I would say, wild and wonderful journey playing and what it looks like to be a professional athlete in America in women's soccer. Nice. I, I briefly, I briefly looked at kind of your, your, your playing background, but I'm curious to know um, kind of what your youth upbringing was like. So where did you grow up playing? What was that like? What was your transition from youth to college and then from college to, to the pro world? Um, I started playing soccer when I was five years old, which most American kids did. It's like ASO, your dad coaches. It's like cute. We were the yellow bumblebees. Um, but about, after about three or four years of that, there's not much development. Like a lot of dads didn't play soccer in America. So then I joined a club team, I think at 10 or 11. Um, and then I was on that for a year or two. And then I ended up switching to blues, which is a pretty big club in Southern California. And it's like all girls club. We wear like neon jerseys with like tiny blue, very annoying, um, which also was along our style of play. I, I would say like we'd high press and then we'd build and possess. And so the coaches would have the teams building and possessing at like eight or nine years old. So a lot of parents were like, we're pulling the kid. And the coach is like, that's yeah. fine. We learn good soccer. And so he was really bought into like, like style of soccer, like drawing teams out, possessing through them. And then like he had, he would call it the seven powerful parts of soccer. And he kind of would take 30 minutes of talking before every training. Then we trained for two hours. And it was very like systematic. As a young kid, it was like almost boring, but like it built pictures in your head. Cause he's like, y'all don't watch soccer. This is going to put a picture in your head. So when you see things, you know what to do. Um, and he actually was coaching the U14 national team then. So he like was helping the U.S. develop its talent. He sto- right. sent stop, but he's still coaching at Blues. And it was a very, very good growing up experience. Um, I liked it best because when I joined it, I think joined that team at 14, I was like, I would always be like, I'm the worst player on the team. I love this. Because when I was around people better than me, I had always had something to strive towards that was really close. Like get a little better first touch, be able to get in the tackle a little quicker, challenge for the header, like work on your one v one dribbling, like finish the chances you get. So I really like the environment of being like new on a team that was really really good. Um, and then I made these national team at sixteen. I was playing for the U seventeens, played in a World Cup um, in New Zealand, and that was a really really great life experience. And that was when I was kind of like, wow, like this matters to the world, like this is really cool. And that was when I was like, oh, I want to play in the Olympics one day, which I still haven't done in next year's Olympic year. So that'd be really cool. But there's a lot of details to that, that it's like stay in your lane and focus on what you can control. If it's God's plan for you, it'll happen. And that's been a really helpful kind of headspace to stay in while I've been playing for the last nine years professionally. Um, but at that age is when I was like, oh, that'd be really sick. That's my dream. And then I, we, we lost actually in the finals to North Korea, which was fascinating. So we're like Americans, like in these hotels in New Zealand mm. and we, we're in the finals against North Korea. And we're like, getting those dollies sprinting through the hotel like messing around having fun and then their screen team walks in they are single file every single girl is five foot ten bowl cut they walk in if they need to make a 90 degree turn it gets a military and we're like what is this and then as they're walking in they're having their televisions carted out of their hotel rooms because like they can't have insight or outside information into their brains according to their government so that was like whoa like this, this is crazy. Like, you're just a lot of, I'd say, eye-opening experiences of, like, culture's different. And, like, that is a big deal to, like, how human lived experiences felt. So that was really cool. Um, then I played on the U20 national team for about a year and a half. And what was a little bit weird was the head coach for the U20 national team happened to be the UCLA coach. And I had committed to USC, which is, like, a pretty big rivalry in Southern California for college sports. And, like, every one- month we'd have camp and she or a player would be like, hey, there's a full ride for at UCLA. And every time I'd be like, fight on, like go USC, like a little punk, which didn't really like probably help me circumstantially. Uh, I ended up going to USC and then I got drafted out of the pros. My college team was really, really bad. And I almost like, I like at the end of it, to, to say that I still love soccer, I would say it's some sort of a miracle because it, I mean, it was, the coach got like fired for embezzling money. He was part of like the college varsity blues situation. If you heard about that, um, he came from a background that like, I would say like women weren't, um, their opinion wasn't as valued um, in in conversation. So he'd treat us like very like, I'm the boss, do this. And and I don't like, I don't mind getting like told what to do, but there were some layers where he would just like curse a lot. And like, I would call it almost disrespectful, but he had won the championship his very first year and then had like extended his contract. And then just like, 
everything went sideways. And like every year he'd like, we have him and I have a meeting. He's like, all right, you got to buy in. I'm like, okay, I buy in. And then all of a sudden he'd like, he's create, like he'd bench me on the second game. And I'm like, we just won four zero. What's wrong with you? And he's like, you didn't do what I said. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So we just have like a lot of like player coach, I would say issues. And I almost transferred like two or three times. My friends at Stanford UCLA would be like, come with a full ride. And I'd be like, don't talk to me emotionally weak. So that was like a fun journey going through that of just like overall, like I want to be at this school, even if soccer doesn't work out. And then full circle, like I got drafted and I've been playing pro the last nine years. So it's definitely been this like really big up journey. And I would even say I didn't like love soccer, like I'll like really, really appreciate the depth of it until I was in my first year after the pros. I went on loan to Japan and I played there for three months. And I was like, whoa. Like, this is so cool. And I kind of got lost in the process of development of like, what can you work on and kind of tinkering with like the different things you can control as an athlete to get better. No, I saw, and we were just chatting right before you logged in your, your journey's quite, quite uh, special and quite, it looks very, uh, very interesting. Um, but, but I noticed that I think you mentioned at the beginning of what you were saying, you know, if, if you don't have love for the game, it seems almost impossible to kind of you know, put yourself through those difficult situations and then actually go through with them all the way. Mary, anything you want to, you want to add to that? No, it was really interesting. Uh, I mean, to hear like all the details and, and, you know, that long well, story, well, one kind of thing that popped out of my mind, it was really interesting. The, the approach, how early you guys got into like a style of play and, um, a style of play and kind of the like at eight nine years old you were where the coach was talking tactics and this and stuff and you how, how did you I kind of wanted to know like how how did you guys respond to that how did the teammates kind of respond to that like sounds like you guys did well so in in a way it was a positive experience but I'm kind of curious at how you know at that age like what's kind of going through your mind like let's say more detail like and then also later on it would be cool to kind of go into Europe because we saw that uh, you also had had time in Europe and and I think that would be really good to get into. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I didn't join that team on blues with Ted Boback until I was 14, but the girls that had been on the team since seven, like eight, nine or so were like, that was like the stories they said and the parents were big on like, we've bought into the style. So I think at least youth sports in America, a lot of times the parents' opinion matters a lot, which is like, I don't think great, but that's just this culture we're in. Um, and I would also say that even at 14, like I came from like not much of a soccer background, like culturally. And so he, having the coach talk to us, it's like, we want to be, be the best. He's coaching at the highest level. So like do whatever he says kind of thing. Um, but it, it was, I would almost say boring to like slip for 30 minutes and him to talk through the seven powerful parts of soccer and the style and why we play it and like the triggers to look for like it was good but it was just really really repetitive but then again we ended up winning the national champ i don't know if i said that we won the national championship at like 16 and then we're in the finals 17 and 18 so like at the club level so that's like the highest level of club sports in america at the time and so you're kind of like oh it works and so it was i would say a very like not fun but like useful and i would say to a lot of kids that are probably would listen to this like it doesn't have to be fun that you need to stick to something have discipline and choose to like put the effort in and like I would say give it a longer timeline that you just like commit to and you almost refuse to have an opinion about. I'm just trying to learn. I'm just trying to understand. I'm trying to grow. And then say in six months or a year, then we can look back, take stock and decide, was this worth it? And then you can change or not change. But I do think like sticking with something that on the surface is boring, repetitive is like the only way you develop at core things. I think that you stuck out through it because we see that a lot. I think there's a fine line between what you mentioned earlier when a, cro when a coach crosses the line um, but there's also, I think a lot of players are hesitant from being managed by coaches that are really going to push them and really get the most out of them. And so you kind of get into this complacent comfort zone and you start to question why you're not, maybe your level isn't improving, but maybe it's just, you know, it's just a safe space. So that's kind of what I, that's the, 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 what I'm picking up from, from that coach. Um, but before we jump into that, you, you went into your stories about overseas, what was the culture shock? like because you talked about you know the asian culture what was what was europe like and then i briefly looked at your you you had some time in australia if i'm not wrong right you yeah want to talk a little bit briefly about each country and, and and the difference yeah um okay so japan i was 24 first year out of college first off season i had and that was like the biggest culture shock of my entire life and i would say america is very well, we're really Hellenistic, first of all. So you value like art, sport and culture and business. And and then 
you're also very like everything that was important America was like where you're from the activities you did the culture you like what's around you and then you go to I went to Japan for soccer so like all I care about is good at soccer they did not care the college I went to the family I'm from the location I did the other cool things I did so I was like whoa that kind of like stripped away so much of the identity I thought was important and I was like wait what really matters here and then I and then their cultures I think very religiously Buddhist if I remember correctly and so or maybe it's Hindu I'm messing up so it's some other religion and going there like kind of made me question like reality and what is true and I would say outside of sport like that was probably like the biggest growth phase in my life where I was like okay what is real and growing up in American culture and like how I grew up we like went to church on Sundays and it was Christian and so then I had I started reading through the Bible more and I was like okay what is real and I was like all right I don't a lot of what I thought was true isn't really true but like I believe the Bible is true and we're going to start there and everything else we can rebuild but like we're going to just go off this I don't fully understand the Bible we're going to keep trying to understand it and like let that guide things as a lens so that was like a huge life-changing moment there and on that team I actually played with a girl named Aya Miyama who was up for the ball and that year with Carly Lloyd and I think a German girl and that was like so cool as a player to be with somebody that's one of the best in the world and see how they train and like ask them questions of like hey what should I do she literally was like yeah, honestly, like you're, you're, you're fast enough, you're strong enough, you're fit enough. She's like, I would just say like 20 minutes, stay up like ball work, like slow <laughs> it down and be really technically excellent. And like the drills I do today still are from Joe. She taught me and we would do after training with the girls of just like being like technically excellent. And if you watch Jap- Japanese women's soccer, like they're technically the best team probably in the world. Like everything's the same. Everything's consistent. They know exactly where to be, when to be and how to do it. So that was like a really cool thing there. Um, and the culture was really different, which I liked, but was hard for me. And then when I was in Sweden, they're really small. I think it's like 10 million people in the whole country. I lived in like a tiny village. I would bike to training. Um, it was a very simple life, which I enjoyed. And that was for four months during 2020, which is also interesting because like the rest of the world shut down and Sweden was like, it's herd immunity. Like we're not going to treat COVID like everybody else. And so everything kind of kept going, which like was like nice as somebody who wants to play soccer. Um, and that was like again, both those countries didn't speak English as a first language. They all learned it in school, but we're like, really like, oh, I'm not good at it, but they're pretty good at it. We're like, I know nothing about those languages. Another, I would say a problem with American culture was like, we don't really learn about others. We're like the best, which is like kind of true, kind of not true. So like, maybe we should be a little bit more self-aware and situationally aware. That's another conversation for another time. Um, so Sweden was really cool. Their soccer culture is really, really big too, too. So that was cool to be around and just like, be able to like watch the game more around people who study the game and enjoy the game. Um, that was like also very like I would say isolating experience because it's like a small village small town um and then Australia I personally really liked but like they speak English I surf a lot so I was surfing like one to four times a day the soccer wasn't the best in Australia I think it's getting better I would say that Japan had like I went to Japan tactically of like I'd say or decision wise I was like America's the best at like mentality and athleticism for girls soccer Japan's the best at tactical and technical soccer I want to go there to learn So that my time there was like a very strategic move on my part of like, this is what I want to get better as a player. And I would say it's paid off a ton. And like with like kind of the mindset of like, ooh, like this is so fun. I'm like learning and growing. And that's been like a really fun thing that I've been able to take with my my career. Nice. Um, Just to to kind of wrap up on the playing, um, can you talk a little bit, bit about now the transition between like top tier NWSL? I know you've played for multiple teams in that, in that league. And, and then what, what you see now, I guess maybe you were lacking at the beginning of your career because you said, you know, you go to Japan, you see how technical some girls are. I know that, you know, the NWSL is the top, top level. Um, what do you see that, that players need? If you're, if you were giving advice to a young player, what, what would you say they should look out for trying to play for those leagues? Um, I would say, first thing I would say, focus on what you can control. And like, then I, to go deeper on that is like, being coming really self-aware of like what you're naturally gifted at and then like pushing the limits and maxing out on those and then that's like what you are in control of and then on the flip side look at situations and teams and styles of play and be like what are they looking for and what can I pair my skills with to like match it well and so I would say like to be pretty like I would say like systematic about it we're like one of my good friends um have played in on Gotham for a year or two is Carly Lloyd and I would train with her just like on the side and I went to a session with her and her trainer and the whole thing was like we did like one thing for 20 minutes and we just repeated it repeated it, repeated it. and the and there was no like try harder go fast it was like be slow and methodical and be excellent which was a similar to the Japanese style and when we did that I was like oh like 
this is how you become excellent at headers from this position. This is how you become excellent at like, like finishing slotted passes off the end line. Like, oh, this is so much easier than you think. It's just almost again, boring or repetitive. And that was a really cool kind of thing where I would say to players, like, look at like and another big thing, watch the game. And I will say one thing that's helped me a lot, watch the game, not coming from a soccer culture is um, this like, well, like watch like a half and I'll have like a, piece of paper and I'll draw a field and as I start the game I'll just trace where the ball goes while I'm watching which kind of helps you build a mental image of like things happening so you're not just watching the ball you're trying to watch people off the ball their movement their timing and I like learned that from a guy named Scott Prohaska who like coached a lot of like I would say like Olympic figure skaters Olympic ice hockey players and he was like Wayne Gretzky's dad would make him watch the first and second period of every like game on tv tracing it and then the third period he'd go watch with his friends but he's like you have to study this and like that's why Wayne was always in the right place at the right time and I would say that applies like very similarly to soccer because both games are free-flowing and player-led so if you can start like I would almost call it like knowing when to do what that's like the biggest thing in sport especially soccer and I'd almost define that kind of as timing and that's like being like when is like timing of when to do things how the kind of game shaping up your teammates are moving the opponents moving and the pace of the ball is moving and then on this flip side of the what part like have I systematically like Carly does like the Japanese do built out my arsenal of skills if that's first touches different like dribble moves ability to check my shoulder and have spacing of shoulder and it's like if I've learned those skills enough so then when the moment comes I can do it excellently and I'd say that would be like the best way to systematically grow um I'll, and then I also think the players have to take that onto themselves because you're going to have your team coach, you're going to have your like private trainer, you're going to have your strength coach, your speed coach, your like mental coach, like that's all great and important. But if you don't like have step back and be like, okay, which of these five are moving the needle the most? And then like cutting out some and focusing on that every couple of months, you won't develop as much as you could. Wow. You, you, you gave a lot of nuggets of wisdom there. Mayor, anything? <laughs> Um, yeah, well, one, one thing I was, I wanted to ask earlier, I was curious, how, how was it adapting to, you know, in Japan to that different style that you were used to? And, you know, was it, was it challenging, you know, was, was the game a lot faster and more technical? Was it, was it more challenging to, um, kind of catch up? Did you feel you were behind? I'm, uh, I'm curious how, how that experience was. Yeah, I definitely felt that I was technically behind slash could get a lot better so I'd spend extra time every day working on that but I would say I was I was like faster and stronger than most of them so then it almost mm -hmm. turned into like okay like America's like effort 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 it's like actually do 10% less mm -hmm. use your brain a little bit more and then kind of like try to get into the flow of things and like find a rhythm with it and that their like, Japan's really good at that because again they I would say they've mastered when to do what They've got the technical excellence and they study it. And so they know the spacing and timing. And like, that's where like, okay, how do you get there? It's like, slow it down so that you're consuming information of what's going on and then start honing in on which details that you're noticing. Like, oh, my center back dropped off. Cool. Now I can like open up and then the whole, like the other team's forward and six is going to shift. And then I can chop again and go down the line or play my nine or my winger. So like, it's like the little details of like, two or three people off ball making a movement, watching the whole team shift and then going, but having the patience to be like, sit on the ball. And that I think was a big thing where in America was like, go, 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 go. And like Japan's like, why are you doing that? There's no thought behind it. It's like, oh, actually give the space one, two, three seconds for the thought to happen. So cool. so true. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, and I was also curious what, you know, you, you've, you know, you've experienced the collegiate level, professional level all around the world. What were some of the, maybe if you could point one or two, hardest moments in your career, uh, most difficult situations, let's say, where, you know, uh, you, you touched it briefly on your introduction. You know, there were a couple hard moments and, and you weren't sure about, you know, about continuing soccer and stuff like that. Could, I was wondering if you could kind of go into more detail about that or if there was any, any such moments. Um, I would say... I would say one like kind of moment that was probably the hardest for my career was getting a lot of injuries in 2017. In 2016, I was on North Carolina Courage. We had a new coach or a coach from the year before. We had won the championship and I started every game and it was like a great year. And they're like, you're going to make the national next year. And I was like, yeah, but I'm on this new team. We like got bought and brought down to North Carolina from Western York Flash. And on this team, they, uh, if I mentioned the first game, they were, I was playing right back and he's like, I'm going to play here at the field you're making people off the back line. It gives me a heart attack. Like I love the flavor and the style, but like, let's get you away from like our own goal. I'm like, great. I would love to play our field. So I'm like subbing at winger first game, five minutes in, I like play a ball down line outside of my foot, like putting texture on it, 
because it's fun. But then I tear my hamstring and I'm like 25 right now. And I have never had a hamstring in my life. And that was very, very hard for me because I'm like over here, like, oh, I think I'm fine. And I would say like having like I get to again say slowing down and figuring out like what I'm actually feeling. Is it tight? Is it strained? Is it still injured? Like that, like learning your body, learning my body was a really, really hard period for me. And that took instead of like a two, three weeks out for like a grade two hamstring, I ended up being out for three months because I came back to really two times. And then that was like one injury in the next two years. I had like seven injuries, all soft tissue related, which really made me oh, have wow. to like grow up of like, okay, in college, you were like a little bit crazy. You were like sleeping for a night. You're really social. You had a lot of fun and you're good enough to get away with it. Well, now you're in the pros and you're not like be professional about it. So I had the two things I changed was like, okay, you need to sleep eight hours a night non-negotiably and then you need to stretch and for me like for my physiology and like how I've trained my whole life stretching is like exactly what I needed and I still do like most days especially if I train and it's like the way I stretch is like in like the concept is to like stretch the ligaments and the joints or the ligaments and tendons in the joints and I will like hold a position for about 20 like long slow breaths kind of like this Like that'd be one and do 20 of those just so that your body goes from like parasympathetic to sympathetic and unwinds because most of sport is like really high level, high intensity, a lot of information, a lot of decision-making and then demanding out of your body. And then like after training 20 minutes of stretching like that, like that deregulates you and kind of like would help me like not stay in that like high intensity state. So those are the two things I changed from like over seven injuries in two years. And that was like the heart, I would say the harsh part. I were halfway through that. I went to my brother who I'm pretty close with and I was like, should I just like retire? Like what's happening on my third injury in like five, six months. And he's like, do you love soccer? And I was like, yeah. He's like, then stop being a baby and actually sleep eight hours. Like look in the mirror and be honest. With you. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> and then I like applied it and it's like, oh, it works. Like I have to just manage that. So I got, I got that. Have you guys heard of a whoop? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's like tracking device. So, so I like got that and that helped me for about a year or two. And then I'd be with my family. My brother's like, okay, Elizabeth, what does the whoop say? Is it time to sleep? Says the whoop. Is it time to eat? Says the whoop. I'm like, all right, leave me alone. He's like, oh, you're like a cyborg. And I was like, no, I'm not. But it was really helpful for a year or two just to get like a pulse and like what's changing. And again, I ended up stopped using it. And I was like, oh, wait, cool. Sleep eight hours. Like, it's not that hard. Like, you don't need something to tell you. You just need to do it. And like, I think that's what's really hard for a lot of humans and athletes is like, yeah, I know the right thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing it. It's like, no, wait, slow down. Are you doing it? So true. Yes or no. Like, be honest with yourself. And I think that's the biggest thing for everyone, I would say, is like, the more honest you can be with yourself, the more success you'll have. And sometimes that'll be a sideways journey because you're like, honestly being lame at life. And then once you start actually reckoning with yourself, you'll start getting better at whatever you choose to focus on. Why don't we try? I really like that. Go ahead, ahead, Juan. No, no, I was just saying, uh, I mean, it was a good moment to transition into kind of what you have going on right now with with, uh, Swaz Athlete, if I'm pronouncing it uh, properly. Yeah, Um, that was great. Because you, you, I think that that segues right into the, that, that, that area or that field, which is, is off the ball, you know, which I think to me is you get to a certain technical level where at the top level, everybody's technical, right? And so the, the, the. The margins are very fine. So why don't you go into a, a little bit of detail and explain to us um, kind of what you are, are working with with uh, with Swaz. Awesome. Yeah, so I built a, a product called Swaz Athlete. And my goal with that is to, it's like a, I would say it's like a tool slash system that can help athletes take ownership of their development and then systematically build themselves and like grow to whatever it is they're capable of growing and enjoy the process of that. Cause I think a lot of times people don't know what to do. So they just take a ton of information in and they get stressed all the time. And using this tool will help them be like, cool, input all the information and then I'll decide what works. And a lot of it hinges on the 80, 20 concept, which basically says of all the things you do, 20% of your actions are driving 80% of your results. So then self audit, get more honest with yourself, look back, what is actually caught, like moving the needle most and like checking in on that. And I think that is like how you can kind of like optimize and then like, I'd say like accelerate faster at whatever you're trying to get better at. Um, And one thing I've always wanted as a pro and even like growing up was like a lot of times, especially in America, it's like, do more, have this person that like, get all this help. And then you're like, I have no time to breathe. And so I would have loved somebody that could kind of sit in the middle. That's not an expert in any of the fields, but like has lived what I'm trying to do and be like, Hey, actually like maybe do less of strength right now. Focus on this. Like just to almost consult you. And like, so with Swaz athlete, there's a tool that you'd use like roughly five minutes a day that helps you kind of like systematically work on things and the flow of it's like pretty user-friendly where it's like one thing at a time. And then the other piece of it is like a weekly zoom call with like a pro athlete and at the beginning of be myself. And over time, I like to build it out to like 
a pro athlete in each sport so they can kind of if you will like give reference or consult on like what a basketball player should be doing at this point in their season and like every kid's going to come from a different background like level they're at location they're in um types of coaching they're involved with and it's like cool what can you do and, and realistically in my opinion with the internet like you don't need that much outside help you just need to like look at your game and study it we're like Kobe Bryant was probably the best at it he like if you look back at his thing he like at 14 he's like I want to be the best with driving with my right hand of the hoop he'd spend six months driving with his right hand of the hoop and then the next six months left hand's got to get there and like he didn't really care what his friends were doing or, or points he scored he's like I'm going to over on this one skill and master it and like listening to him talk about that being around Japan being around Carly Lloyd was like oh like this is the way and so this tool I'm hoping helps athletes kind of optimize and get to what they can get to as, a, as an athlete that's amazing. I think that's very special. I think that you have something very uh, interesting. Um, and I like the fact that you're kind of uh, planting seeds in all, you know, fields of, of soccer or of sport. I think you, you, you know, you mentioned like the technical training, you can't escape. There's no app. There's no nothing. You know what I mean? It's just work. Put in the work. Exactly. Um, but I also like that you're very well-rounded and you have, you know, you have this that kind of caters towards mindset and mentality and, and kind of just your overall well-being but then you know to touch on now what you have going on with uh Les Spellman which is more physical and I think it's very cool that you know you really leave no gaps um so if you kind of want to just kind of break down how what first of all what players can find in that speed program what your contribution was to that um and just kind of give us a bit more detail on that yeah so um I've been training with Les for the last I'd say five years or so uh, my friend I played lacrosse at USC too like little side story. I, my boyfriend at the time played football and baseball and I was like, I want to play two sports. So then I was like looking at sports at USC and it was between, like, again, like in my head, I hadn't really talked to these coaches was basketball, water polo and lacrosse and lacrosse was new. So I ended up reaching out to the coach. It worked out. I played, they gave me like money for end of college and grad school. So like soccer split the scholarships were like really happy because I can get more players that were good, which was nice. And then, so I'm playing lacrosse and a girl on the team that was a bit younger does like content. She's like a entertainer and she ended up shooting content for less and she posted on instagram and i literally was like oh, wait this is cool so i dm less i was like hey for soccer they test the 30 meter dash time and we're about to go into preseason in like five six or like probably two three months can i come like get faster and he was like yeah i show up tomorrow 7 a.m so i show up and less is like all right you're with the you're with the vets and it's like me and like 10 nfl vets ranging from my age at like 25 to like 32 and i was like sick and i'm like this little five five girl like doing my best like not slow but like with all these men who are like physical specimens which was like cool to be around and but he treated he treated all of us like you're here to train here's your objectives here's your goal so at one point we're throwing medicine balls like triple extension and stuff and not mine go like 20 yards they're like 40 yards so i'll throw it they have to walk up walk back 20 yards and it was like i was always slowing down a little bit but he less was like you're here to get better they're here to get better that's all i care about and i really love how less coaches like that where he's like i don't care what you're into your background like we're here to push and here's scientifically backed ways to do that and he's i mean this man is brilliant and his story is fascinating and insane as well and we've become good friends over the time and he reached out to me probably a couple months ago and was like hey I would really like to do like a soccer speed program. And I've worked with him soccer stuff wise the last probably like a year, specifically this off season, we did a bit of work together. And he was like, like, so basically what happened is me and my trainer, Sam, and sat down and like watched film and pulled out game moments that apply to less as I would say like speed theory. So when he breaks down speed, there's like, acceleration there's deceleration there's max velocity and the change of direction so speed is really four things so sometimes you know when you watch players you're like like messi i wouldn't say as fast he's like has really good a cell d cell do you know what i'm saying like he's top end speed's not the best in the world he's like really good at shiftiness which in in like i would say speed terms is like a cell d cell and change of direction so like speeds i would say a lot more layered and complex than people i would say give it credit for and less as i would say coin terms built it out and like put science behind it which is really cool so we ended up like systematically pulling out moments of soccer games and then designing i would say drills for that and then we ran them by less and he was like yes this is this this is this no that's not it so we built it together and then i was the i would say like athlete model of like this is what you should be doing and how it should be done and then sam was like the one driving the training as like coach trainer whatnot and so the end and less would be like cool and this is what they did this is why they did it and this is how and so it, it definitely breaks into quite a few details but like it, it literally like I love how less things because he again kind of like Japan and Carly like systematically broke it down and then we put in inputs and then it's like cool if we build these blocks they're eventually going to get bigger stronger and layer on themselves and now you're competent or excellent at a skill so that would I would say is like great for like it's probably mainly geared towards coaches and trainers 
But like, if you're an athlete and you want to get better at parts of your game, like I would have bought it had I been five years ago and like, cool, I want this. For sure. That's amazing. Mary, uh, I know, I know we're getting close to, to, to the time that you got. We can go a little more time. I, I just have to be there at nine and it's about 10 minutes away. So Perfect. I have like 15 minutes. Mary, anything you want to, you want to touch about? I know, I know Elizabeth mentioned a lot about the course. Anything you want to, you want to ask? Yeah, cool. Yeah. I, uh, um, well, one, I was curious, you know, how did you feel, you know, all that speed work with less, how did you feel that, you know, how, how, how much of an impact did that have in your game? And especially, you know, an impact with your injury history. And, and if you had a, you know, history of hamstring in, injuries, I'm sure that would have kind of came up in your training at some point. And I'm sure less would have intervened and, and, and helped with that and, 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 you know, take it from there. Uh, I'd be cool to hear about that. And then we could go into, you know, maybe a little more detail or two about the program. Cause it sounds really good. Yeah. Okay. Great question. So hamstrings has probably been my biggest, like injury struggle that's happened a few times i was on loan in sweden in 2020 i strained my hamstring third week and i do think it's hard going into environment and like being able to manage yourself but you're also trying to be like almost prove yourself on a new team so week three i strained my hamstring i like call up less <laughs> we get on a zoom call he's like excel spreadsheet here's your program for the next six weeks and you're gonna like rebuild i would say like the and a lot of it was like lifting stuff like you're rebuilding the neural connections slowly building out the strength and you're doing well, like there's three hamstrings and like high low and medium part of your hamstring like we really kind of really worked on that from a strength perspective and then he's like you have to be getting at least two three times a week five hill sprints 40 meters long at 80 percent like you, you just have to get the load in at certain angles so you can put and then wheel there or push it like a almost sprinting with resistance and so he had me factor in those two things like hill sprints and resistance sprinting just to get the load up so my muscles can handle like the actual sprinting um that helped me a lot recover quickly and be like live with my team um and again that's like not really speed but that's like a building block so that you can run fast um and then in regards to the program um but yeah, I mean, it's pretty much like here's like mul multiple drills in each category. So it would be like change of direction drills, acceleration drills, deceleration drills, and max speed drills. And it's all involved with the ball. So it's like cool, like in games, like this is what happens. So was, for example, say you're watching um, Liverpool, ball comes to the outside back, and then he pings it in behind down the line, and your nine's hitting a max sprint to get there kind of thing. Or like the balls. So there's, there's just like... I would say, and you can almost look through a game of soccer and pull out many, many clips of like what would be scenarios. And then you would recreate the scenarios in games. Another thing I'll say is when I train with Carly, one thing I learned a lot, which I really bad and I've taken a lot into my trainings um, for myself has been like watching what you want to do and then like just replicating it. So a guy I would train with, his name is Brian in uh, like New York, New Jersey area. I would go to his like indoor soccer gym and I, I would, he'd pull up like find three clips from highlights that week of like EPL. And then he, we, I would literally get like 50 balls and you get 50 reps at each like moment. So he'd drive in a ball and be like, this is how they scored this. And it'd be like this type of movement. So we would just like put out like hours into replicating highest level moments that were excellent. And like the cool thing when you watch highlights is like, there are unlimited new creative ways to score goals every weekend. Mm -hmm. and it's like find whatever you thought was really cool and like and works for your skill set. And then like that makes training, I would say, really fun and fresh, but also like game like. So he would put himself in different positions if it's from like the sixth position, from the winger position, from the nine laying off to the 10. Like, cool, he's going to play the, if you will, secondary position and I'm playing the one who scores. And so he'd sit himself there with a bag of balls and like ping it into me and that would like do the movement. And like every goal comes from a pass. So like you need one other person and you need yourself, like get a bag of balls and go to a goal with like, I would say a proper 18. Like I'm really big on like details. If I don't have an 18 or a full size goal, like I'm going to be really annoyed because then I'm going to think I'm bad and I'm not. It is usually how I train it, but yeah. So like, I would just say like systematically building it like that. I think, and and when one thing that that just kind of popped up to me is, you know, I think, and I wanted to ask you, you know, what when's the right time to to focus on certain things? I don't know if let's say you know if you're a youth player, is it is speed the primary focus? Is your mentality the primary focus? Is your technique right? It's if you had to break it down in very simple terms, what would you you know, where would you prioritize what? What would you think? A really good question. Um, I think honestly, <laughs> number one always is like that you're having fun and like challenging, competing, pushing like that. You need to like find joy in it because if you don't do that, you won't, you'll stop. It, it's too much of a burden to bear. Like having like an enjoyment of it and finding parts of the game you enjoy. And then I would say that I, 
I would honestly say like the technical piece, you still get in like change of direction, some acceleration, deceleration. You might not hit top, top speed, but like I would say like technical things is like from the young, young age, like that is huge and like having fun with it because you're going to get better and the kids will push themselves because they want to win as if it's competitively designed. Um, and then I would say like the speed stuff, what's really cool with the program and what less than Darcy, the guy who the fourth person in our group that made the soccer speed program, um, he's the... Uh, I probably call him the sports scientist or sports performance coach for the U S men's national team. So a big thing he added to us, our thing was periodization. So basically that's like, if we, and everything hinges off game day for soccer. So if it's like, we're a uh, match day minus five, that's the day to go really hard and do your like max sprints. And then like match day minus two, oh, you're probably doing more change direction, excel, a cell. And so certain parts load your body differently. And so even at a young age, the scheduling is rough with like four games on, a weekend and stuff like that or even sometimes six but like it would be like looking at like your calendar and what days can you push for what thing so from the speed perspective they've periodized that very well so for coaches that would get it it's like oh cool now i know like you're asking me like timing and when to do what and like at certain ages like speed i would say speed can like always be developed and especially as it's broken down into the four categories because you're just like giving them exposure to things and then the cool thing with the way they've designed it is like you're getting exposure in like I would say soccer like scenarios versus like random like steal the bacon and other kind of games people play of like toss the ball out there and like run around like without any thought behind it. But again, like how if you design steal the bacon in a way that applies to a game moment, like I would say even more valuable. Um, and then I would say like I don't think I'm like a big like be like um for strength side side of it. I would say like being able to move your body well, like body weight stuff, like can you do like pull-ups and push-ups and sit-ups like very proficiently like B have like really good proprioception and body awareness is really important and I don't even think like lifting to like 16 is probably like for girls at least like you don't really need to lift much but yeah I don't know and that's so, my opinion I like that a ton of I don't know if you guys have seen the the Thierry Henry conversation on that new podcast I think Clint Dempsey has with uh I can't remember exactly Charlie can't remember his last name but Thierry Henry says the same thing like if you you only have time for so much, right? And if you're 13 to 16 and you dedicate half your time to, to getting stronger, then that's half the time that you could have dedicated towards, you know, technical work. And 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 at 16, you can't really get that technical time back, right? Like I mean, you 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 can vouch for that. You are you know you're you're always chasing at that point if you miss out on those developmental um, gaps. So I just yeah. that, was, that was so interesting the way that you that you're kind of. You know, you 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 don't leave any category out. You know, technical training, mental training, physical training. But I think, you know, the 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 premise from what I'm seeing is just simplify things, do the basics right. Keep yeah. it simple. Keep it simple. You're not always there to be entertained. If you're really trying to play professionally, you're you're trying to work. You know what I mean, Mayor? Anything yeah. that that you want to add to that? No, no, you make a, a lot of sense, and I really like that, and that, and that resonates with a lot of what we preach here, right? Keep doing simple things to a high level, going in every day, training, uh, you know, bringing, being 100% competitive every single training session, and all those little little moments um, add up in the long run. So, uh, you know, I really like the conversation today. It really resonates with um, all the themes we've spoke about in the past, and uh, Elizabeth has a unique story, and uh, there's a lot of good stuff. Uh, one kind of question we like to finish off usually is, and I mean, you've give you've given many already. Uh, you know, like one piece of advice to give to a young soccer player, um, you know, that 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 wants to make pro, and uh, you know, what what advice would you give them? I mean, you have loads, but if you had to, let's say, I'll let's say one. if you had to pick one one that you've that you've already touched on. Yeah, I would say the number one piece of advice. For any soccer player that wants to like reach their potential like slash make it pro would be to like watch soccer because the more pictures in your brain that you have so when you see the moment on the field you're you know exactly what to do like that's the picture like and i would literally if you're having trouble watching it and i even think like watching with your friends casually is different than like studying it i would like get that notepad trace a half mm. do one half a week and trace the ball and your literally brain will do all the rest of the work and like that helps, like I would get bored when I was younger. And like now when I trace them, I'm like, oh, this is kind of fun. Like, and you start just absorbing details. Like I would say, watch soccer, watch soccer, watch soccer. Yeah. Don't need to do like 20 hours a week, but like make it a point to like watch each week, at least. I mean, my one of the best coaches I ever had, we won seven, seven championships in four years. He watches like eight games a week. 
and the game's always evolving. So he should come up with it like that. Yeah. It's like, you got to watch to like, even have context to speak on something. Amazing. Uh, Elizabeth, where can people find you if we're trying to, if we're trying to, to get a, a hold of more of your, uh, your socials and uh, your courses? Yeah, I would definitely just say like Instagram, like at Elizabeth Eddie to just the number. Um, and like, just send me a DM. I like working to be better at this. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for for taking the time to chat with us. We we wish you the best with with the rest of your career, with your season, and uh, and and with all your future endeavors. Awesome. Thanks, guys. It's great to meet you. See you soon. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Take care, guys. See ya. Bye.